All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight we're going to read another sutra. Uh, tonight we're still going to be in the Majima Nikaya, the Middle Length Discourses. We're going to be reading sutta number 32, the Mahagosinga Sutta, the Long Discourse at Gosinga. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so um, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, let me tell you, first of all, why I wanted to do this sutra tonight. So uh, actually, the first thing that I can mention is that a long time ago, years and years and years ago, at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, I taught the Chula Gosinga Sutta. So the shorter discourse at Gosinga. Again, this was years ago. Um, actually, it was when the Dharma Collective was in a different space and I, we were meeting in person or I was there in person. But that's a beautiful sutra. So sutra number 31, the Chula Gosinga Sutra, the short discourse at Gosinga. I really like that sutra and I was tempted to just teach it again because those early Dharma doors were not recorded. So there's no record of what I said. I couldn't possibly tell you what I said, but I decided that this sutta, the next one, number 32, is actually a better segue to our conversation from last week. So you'll remember that last week's sutta, it was a kind of a teaching by Shariputra, and I introduced you a little bit to Shariputra as, as like, you know, someone that we often find teaching sutras or that we find in sutras teaching the Dharma. That, that is the correct way to say it. Um, and so this sutta tonight also kind of stars Shariputra in that way. But I wanted to explain a little bit more. There's something very interesting going on with this sutra. So let me quickly kind of just tell you what this sutra tonight is about, and then we'll kind of get to reading it. And I don't think I'm going to read it in its entirety. We're going to read it section by section. But really quickly, as a just a review, or just not a review, but just a look ahead. So this sutta is at Gosinga, and Gosinga is a place. It's a kind of a forest sanctuary in that way where a bunch of the Buddhist followers lived. And in this particular sutta, I believe it is Madhugayana. So one of the monks, Madhugayana, who decides that they want to go chat about the Dharma with Shariputra. And along the way, Magulyayana is joined by Kashapya, is joined by Aniruddha, is joined by Ananda, and is joined by Ravatta. So we have this little group of monks. And what happens is, is that there's this beautiful, this beautiful kind of idea about it's a it's a moon, it's a moonlit night. And the solid trees are in blossom. And Shariputra asks, asks this question. He asks, who, who could light up? Who could illuminate the Gosinga Sala, Sala wood, the Gosinga forest? And one by one, each of those, it starts with Ananda. But one by one, each of those monks that I just mentioned, they proceed to kind of give their, well, the description of their practice, a description of their, uh, in a way, a description of their enlightenment. And that's the idea of what could illuminate the Sala wood forest is this illumination of these enlightened people. Again, one by one, each of them is going to give a kind of a, a description of their illumination. 
And then they're going to go all see the Buddha and make sure that they all got it right. Like that's, that's sort of a, you know, a classic formula with these. But before we even get into that, I want to kind of mention something. And I know that it looks like everybody here is a pretty, you know, um, you've been coming to Dharma Doors for a while. So I want to share this with you. So what it is, is let me, let me start this way. Years ago, for the San Francisco Dharma Collective, I taught a, a series on a very, very famous sutra called the Vimalakirti Sutra. Uh, I think it was an eight, eight week or eight part series. And one of the most famous sections of the Vimalakirti Sutra, I believe it's chapter nine, but don't quote me on that, but it's the chapter called Entering the Gateway of Non-Duality. And what happens is, is that there's a bunch of monks. <laughs> and in that sutra, it's Vimalakirti, who says, Venerables, how did you all discover or how did you all enter the gateway of non-duality? How did, how did you all come to understand non-duality? And one by one, all the monks give their explanation of how they figured out non-duality. And what this is, I haven't quite figured out a name for this yet. I'm searching for a name. So if anybody out there has a good name or an already established name, but what it is is, there's this format. I don't, again, I don't know what you would call it, but it's a Buddhist thing. I haven't seen it anywhere else, but I've seen it a lot in these Buddhist sutras. And it's this kind of format of having this, these series of people like explain something. And then the next person explains it and the next person explains it and so on. This happens in many sutras. And what I kind of want to kind of share with you now is that it would seem that tonight, this sutra is one of the first to, to be in this format. I don't know if it's the first, like the, the very first one, but I do want you to know that a sutra like Vimalakirti or one of these other Mahayana sutras that has this same kind of format. I just want you to know that the format is a very old Buddhist format in that way. Now, before we kind of dive deeper into this one, I want to kind of also mention this. As you know, there's a lot of different ways to read sutras and this is going to be one of those situations where tonight, not only am I going to remind you that I do not read Buddhist sutras historically. Like, I don't, I don't read tonight, I do not read this sutra that this is about a particular night 2,500 years ago where something happened and they recorded it. As most of you know, I read Buddhist sutras allegorically. And by allegorically, what I mean is, is that each of these figures, Shariputra, Ananda, Magulyayana, they all sort of represent something. And so you can read sutras at this kind of allegorical level. And I'm definitely going to encourage us to read and understand tonight's sutra that way. But there's another level, and it has to do with this, um, again, I don't know what to call it. This It's kind of like a daisy chain, I suppose, but it's where this kind of idea is being passed from one person to the next. And so tonight, not only am I going to suggest that we don't read this histor historically, but I'm also going to suggest that when we listen to each of these people explain their illumination, 
it's not even so much about each individual person and what they practiced or what they practice. It's actually going to be about the whole sutra. And the idea is, is that as these move along, each person's teaching or each person's practice is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And so there's a way in which the whole sutra is working as a whole in that sense. And it's not just about Ananda or just about Kashepa or just about whoever. So just wanted to share that with you. Let's dive in and kind of see what, what I'm talking about. So um, yeah, let's just, I'll read the first part and this will kind of set us up. So thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the park of the Gosinga Sala, wood, Sala tree wood, together with a number of very well-known elder disciples, the Venerable Sariputra, the Venerable Maha Magalalana, the Venerable Maha Kasapa, the Venerable Anurudha, the Venerable Ravatta, the Venerable Ananda, and other very well-known elder disciples. Then, when it was evening, the Venerable Maha Magalayana rose from meditation, went to the Venerable Maha Kasapa, and said to him, Friend Kasapa, let's go to the Venerable Shariputra to listen to the Dharma. Yes, friend, the Venerable Maha Kasapa replied. Then the Venerable Maha Magalayana and the Venerable Maha Kasapa and the Venerable Anirudha went to the Venerable Sariputra to listen to the Dharma. The Venerable Ananda saw them going to the Venerable Sariputra to listen to the Dharma. Thereupon, he went to the Venerable Ravatta and said to him, Friend Ravatta, those true men over there are going to the Venerable Shariputra to listen to the Dharma. Let us also go to the Venerable Shariputra to listen to the Dharma. Yes, friend, the Venerable Ravatta replied. Then the Venerable Ravatta and the Venerable Ananda went to the Venerable Shariputra to listen to the Dharma. The Venerable Sariputta saw the Venerable Ravatta and the Venerable Ananda coming, <clears throat> saw them in the distance, and, they, and he said to the Venerable Ananda, Let the Venerable Ananda come. Welcome to the Venerable Ananda, the Blessed One's attendant, who is always in the Blessed One's presence. Friend Ananda, the Gosinga solitary wood is delightful. The night is moonlit. The solid trees are all in blossom. And heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air. What kind of bhikkhu, Venerable Ananda, or Friend Ananda, what kind of bhikkhu could illuminate the Gosinga solitary wood? Ananda replied, Here, friend Sariputta, a bhikkhu has learned much, remembers what he has learned, and consolidates what he has learned. Such teachings as are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and the right phrasing, and which affirm a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Such teachings as these he has learned much of, remembered, mastered verbally, investigated with the mind, and penetrated well by view. And he teaches the Dharma to the four assemblies with, with well-rounded and coherent statements and phrases for the erat eratification of the underlying tendencies. That kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. So that's Ananda's description of the type of monk that could illuminate the solitary wood. 
I'm going to kind of just let that one sit there. But in reading it, I just wanted to make sure you were aware. <laughs> Ananda is referring to himself. So Ananda is the type of monk who has learned much, remembers what he has learned, consolidates what he has learned. Ananda is one who's consolidated teachings that are good in the middle, good in the this, good in the end. So he's referring to himself in that way. We'll have a reason to come back to Ananda, but now kind of to get the flow, let's see about Ravatta. So when this was said, the Venerable Sariputta addressed the Venerable Ravatta and said, Friend Ravatta, the Venerable Ananda has spoken according to his own inspiration. Now I ask, now we ask the Venerable Ravatta. Friend Ravatta, the Gosinga solid tree wood is delightful. The night is moonlit. The solid trees are in all in blossom, and heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air. What kind of bhikkhu, friend Ravatta, could illuminate this Gosinga solid tree wood? Ravatta replied, Here, friend Sariputra, a bhikkhu delights in solitary meditation and takes delight in solitary meditation. He is devoted to internal serenity of mind, does not neglect meditation, possesses insight, and dwells in empty huts. That kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. When this was said, the Venerable Sariputra addressed the Venerable Anirudha. Thus, friend Anirudha, the Venerable Ravatta has spoken according to his own inspiration. Now we ask the Venerable Anirudha, Venerable Anirudha, the Gosinga solid tree wood is delightful. The night is moonlit. The solid trees are all in blossom and heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air. What kind of bhikkhu, friend Anirudha, could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood? Anirudha replied, Here, friend Sariputra, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, a bhikkhu surveys a thousand worlds. Just as a man with good sight, when he has ascended to the upper palace chamber, might survey a thousand wheel rims. So too, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, a bhikkhu surveys a thousand worlds. That kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. When this was said, the Venerable Sariputra addressed the Venerable Mahakasapa. Friend Kasapa, the Venerable Anirudha has spoken according to his own inspiration. Now we ask the Venerable Maha Kasapa, Friend Kasapa, the Gosinga solid wood is delightful. The night is moonlit. The solid trees are all in blossom and heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air. What kind of bhikkhu, Friend Kasapa, could illuminate? this Gosinga solitary wood. Kasapa replied, Here, friend Sariputra, a bhikkhu is a forest dweller himself and speaks in praise of forest dwelling. He is an alms food eater and speaks in praise of eating, eating alms food. He is a refuse rag wearer himself and speaks in praise of wearing refuse rag robes. He is a triple robe wearer himself and speaks in praise of wearing the triple robe. He has few wishes himself and speaks in praise of fewness of wishes. He is content himself and speaks in praise of contentment. He is secluded himself and speaks in praise of seclusion. He is aloof from society himself and speaks in praise of aloofness from society. He is energetic himself and speaks in praise of arousing energy. He has attained to virtue himself 
and speaks in praise of the attainment of virtue. He has attained to concentration himself and speaks in praise of the attainment of concentration. He has attained to wisdom himself and speaks in praise of the attainment of wisdom. He has attained deliverance himself and speaks in praise of the attainment of deliverance. He has attained to the knowledge and vision of deliverance himself and speaks in praise of the attainment of the knowledge and vision of deliverance. That kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. When this was said, the Venerable Sariputra addressed the Venerable Maha Magulalana. Friend Magulalana, the Venerable Maha Kasapa has spoken according to his own inspiration. Now we ask the Venerable Maha Magulalana, Friend Magulalana, this Gosinga solitary wood is delightful. It is the night is moonlit. The solid trees are all in blossom, and heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air. Friend Mogolalyana, what kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga Sala tree wood? Here, friend Sariputra, two bhikkhus engage in talk on the higher dharma, and they question each other. And each being questioned by the other, answers without foundering, and their talk rolls on in accordance with the Dharma. That kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. When this was said, the Venerable Maha Magulyana addressed the Venerable Shariputra thus. Friend Shariputra, we have all spoken according to our own inspiration. Now we ask the Venerable Shariputra, Friend Shariputra, this Gosinga solid tree wood is delightful. The night is moonlit. The solid trees are all in blossom, and heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air. What kind of a bhikkhu, Friend Shariputra, could illuminate this Gosinga solid tree wood? Sariputra replied, Here, friend Matgulyayana, a bhikkhu wields mastery over the mind. They do not let the mind wield mastery over them. In the morning, he abides in whatever abiding or attainment he wants to abide in during the morning. At midday, he abides in whatever abiding or whatever attainment that he wants to abide in at midday. In the evening, he abides in whatever abiding or attainment he wants to abide in during the evening. Suppose a king or a king's minister had a chest full of various colored garments. In the morning, the king could put on whatever pair of garments he wanted to put on in the morning. At midday, he could put on whatever pair of garments he wanted to put on at midday. In the evening, he could put on whatever pair of garments he wanted to put on in the evening. So too, a bhikkhu wields mastery over the mind and does not let the mind wield mastery over them. In the morning, at midday, in the evening, he abides in whatever abiding or attainment he wants to abide in during the morning, afternoon, and evening. That kind of a bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. Then the Venerable Sariputra addressed those Venerable Ones thus, Friends, we have all spoken according to our own inspiration. Let's go to the Blessed One and report this matter to him. As the Blessed One answers, so let us remember it. Yes, friend, they replied. Then those venerable ones went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side. The venerable Shariputra said, to, said this to the Blessed One. Let's pause there. So before we kind of hear what happens with the Buddha and sort of like the second half of the sutra in that way, 
let's go back and just kind of look at this progression of these six bhikkhus. So it begins with Ananda. And that, of course, shouldn't be a surprise because if you're reading sutras allegorically, you know that Ananda is always first. And I don't mean that he's always first, but what I mean is, is that allegorically, Ananda is the beginner. He's the, he's the youngest of them all in that way. Now, he's not literally the youngest, but in terms of when, when Ananda appears in a sutra, he represents the beginner. He represents the most, like, the youngest in that way. And so Ananda, as it mentions, Ananda was the Buddha's attendant. And so he is known for having been present with the Buddha his entire life. And so this is where Ananda gets the reputation for having heard all the Dharma. But not only did Ananda hear all the Dharma, Ananda is famous for having complete retention. He is known for having a, not like a photographic memory. I think there's a fancy word for a, a memory where you don't forget anything. He, ha he supposedly had one of those kinds of memories. Now, when he says this idea of, um, a, th so he's describing himself again, and how he describes himself is a bhikkhu has, who has learned much, remembers what he learns, and who has consolidated what he has learned. Again, that's kind of what Ananda is known for. And then it says, well, regarding the teachings or the Dharma, such teachings are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. Meaning they start off good, they're good in the middle, and they end good, right? All the teachings of the Buddha are like that. And so this idea that they have, that with the right meaning and the right phrasing, and that Ananda remembers all of this, which affirms a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. It says, such teachings as these, he has learned much of, remembers, has mastered verbally, investigated with the mind, and penetrated well by view. So all of that, yes, all of that sort of refers to Ananda, but it also refers to any beginner. This is what any beginner student of Buddhism or beginner student of the Dharma does. You study, you learn. And that's what Ananda did, does, and what Ananda is suggesting in that way. Okay, so that's Ananda, the beginner. What I want you to notice is that when we move to the next bhikkhu, Ravata, Ravata says, right, let's see, where is he? So describing his practice, he says, well, I'm a bhikkhu that delights in solitary meditation, and I take delight in solitary meditation. I'm a bhikkhu who's devoted to internal serenity of mind. I don't neglect meditation. I possess insight and dwell in empty huts. That's the kind of bhikkhu that could illuminate the forest. The, the way that I understand that, again, this is just the way I read it, the way I interpret it and understand it, but the basic idea of kind of traditional, normal, regular Buddhist practice is first, you need to be exposed to the teachings of the Buddha, to the Dharma. You need to learn at least a little bit of Dharma, if not kind of the whole thing, and I don't mean all of it, but you know, you need to know what the teachings are about. And then you take those and you go off alone and you meditate on it. 
so my point is, is that, yes, you could read this as Ananda is like a nerd. And so he studies all the Dharma and that's why he's so smart. And Ravata, he just likes to go meditate all by himself. And that's why he's so smart. You could read it that way. And my presumption is, is that that's the normal way to read this is that it's like for some people, it's about study. For some people, it's about meditation. For some people, it's about this. I don't have any problem with that reading. I think that's a great reading. But I think there's a little more to learn from this sutra if we kind of look at this a little more progressively like that. So Ananda is about the learning of the Dharma as a beginner. Ravata is about the solitary forest dwelling contemplation of that Dharma. Then we get to Aniruddha. Now, Aniruddha, he comes up a lot in sutras. Aniruddha is sort of, as, the, as our sutra tonight mentions, Aniruddha is famous for having the most fully developed divine eye. And most stories of Aniruddha eventually get around to talking about his divine eye ability. That's what he's known for. So the way that Aniruddha describes this is, well, he describes himself or he describes a bhikkhu who has the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses human eyes. And that bhikkhu with that divine eye surveys a thousand worlds. And it's just like somebody with good regular sight who climbs up to a high tower and can look down at a bunch of stuff down below. Anirudha is just like that. But when he's in a meditative concentration, it's as if he's looking down on a thousand worlds. They normally describe Anirudha as he, he has vision that makes the world for him seem like it's a mango in the palm of his hand. That's the way it's normally described. So this is a, well, we could be here all night talking about what exactly is up with Aniruddha and his divine eye. That's kind of like a whole other Dharma talk, like what's up with that? But in order to kind of put this into the context of, of the sutra, the basic idea is that somebody like Ravata has not necessarily developed a purified divine eye. He's off in his empty hut, meditating, developing a divine eye. And so the progression that I see is one from meditation, like Ravata, to the development of the siddhis, to the development of the superpowers, which comes from solitary forest dwelling. So there's kind of a connection here in that way. Again, I don't really have, without going on and on and on about it, I don't have a lot to say about the divine eye and Aniruddha seeing these thousand worlds. He's in a deep meditative state, that's for sure. But any questions about that? I'm happy to answer. But again, I just don't really... Yeah, no, wait, please. Oh, thank you, Michael. Um, what comes to mind for me, if I may, is yeah. is uh, Dogen, Dogen's teaching of if a person wishes to lose themselves, to find themselves, they must lose themselves. Thus, opening themselves to a multitude or of of in of different worlds of different you know a multitude of things being, and to me that speaks this speaks to that awareness, to be present to be aware of multitudes of things constantly, as one moves forward. So I just see a little. I am like yeah, obviously Dogen must have read this but somewhere in China. Indeed. That's all. Thank you.
Yes, Noe. And I think that kind of no matter how we terp- interpret Anirudha, they're they're talking about transcendence. Right. One, again, one way or another. And so again, Ravata, at least his description of it is not transcendent. He's in he's in a hut. <laughs> in the he's in an empty hut in the woods. Anirudha has achieved a state of transcendence, and that's what, in a way, would illuminate the Sala tree wood. Yeah. Yeah, no, please. Do we know of any type of people today that have this ability or this skill? Yeah, you know, I mean, this is this is the risk, Noe. This is the risk of talking about superpowers all night. No, because they're very... Um, they're a very interesting topic in that way. One of the things that I will mention about it is this. So there is, of course, a phenomena. And the phenomena that is attested to in the modern world is a phenomena that would be known. Knows, it goes by a lot of names, but remote viewing is one phenomena that comes to mind. Remote viewing is where people put themselves into meditative trances or meditative states. And essentially, (laughs) their consciousness goes somewhere else and they can see (laughs) what's going on in other places outside of their body. I don't know. I, I can't do that. It's never happened to me, but there are a lot of anecdotal evidence about it. And that type of outer body experience would seem to line up with descriptions of things like Anirudha is talking about. I would really kind of, from a Buddhist point of view, I would really just want to mention this about all of that. So especially if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you've heard this from me before, but Regarding this whole idea of of an outer body experience, like Anirudha or otherwise, from a Buddhist point of view, what should really be kind of investigated and thought about is the idea of an inner body experience. And what I'm getting at is, is that in Dharma doors, we're always talking about this idea of where are you? And what I mean by that, of course, is are you between your ears? Are you behind the eyes? Are you in your hands? Like, where exactly are you? And all of a sudden, we kind of realize, oh, I don't even know where I am. So why is it then that an outer body experience is that wild if you don't even know where you are to begin with? My point is, is that maybe the inner inner body experience, by which I mean the regular way, maybe that's just the default mode way in that sense. So, but again, I don't want to get waylaid too much with speculation. I would rather stay focused sort of on the, again, what I'm kind of setting up as the progress of the sutra, moving from Ananda to Ravata to a veteran meditator like Anirudha. And now we get to Kasapa. And Kasapa, of course, is a very famous, very smart bhikkhu. So... Kasapa describes it like this, and his is a little more, you know, just uh, involved. So Kasapa says of himself, but he's speaking in the third person, so he's speaking about Abiku, who is a forest dweller and promotes forest dwelling or speaks in praise of forest dwelling who is an alms eater, alms food eater, and speaks in praise of eating alms food. He is a refuse rag wearer. And if you didn't know this about the early Buddhists, in early Buddhism, like in the lifetime of the Buddha, 
all of the monks and nuns, all of the, the monastics were supposed to go to graveyards and take clothing off of corpses, rip it up, dye it all saffron, the kind of that yellow color, and then stitch it all together into a robe. That was the original like Buddhist prescription for clothing. And actually, if you didn't know it, originally it was basically advised to be naked. But that became a problem because basically there's a story about one of the monks who was so hairy that when he went knocking on somebody's door for alms food, they thought it was a monster basically. And the and a woman basically, well, either fainted or passed out or died. And so the Buddha was like, okay, folks, no more nudity. I'll tell you what, go to a graveyard, find some rags, stitch them together. So that's what Kasapi is talking about there. And so he's talking about that he's somebody that does that. And he's somebody that speaks in praise of doing that. He's somebody that wears a triple robe. And that's, of course, the formal Buddhist robe is an undergarment, kind of like a, a sari, like a skirt, and then a kind of um, a top robe, and then a large sheet that you would wear like as a shawl, but you would also lay that out on the ground to sit on it. It had multiple functions. So that's the triple robe, the original version of the triple robe. Kashyapya wears the triple robe. He pre speaks in praise of the triple robe. Kashyapya has few wishes and speaks in praise of having few wishes. And, you know, I don't want to go through the entire thing again, but, you know, ideas of being aloof from society um, and then speaking in praise of things like concentration, wisdom, and so on. So, Kashyapya there is, a, is doing a few different things. The first thing that he seems to be doing is he is, and you know, there's a, some kind of like clues in there, but he's praising being a fully ordained Buddhist monk in the formal garb and basically in a way doing the Buddhist practice of being a monk which is not which includes meditation and study but i guess what i'm getting at is is that ananda is your initial study then you take off that that off into the woods and meditate in a empty hut that leads to the development of meditative concentration let's call it superpowers and now we kind of are going back into the world in our triple robe. We are learned, we are meditative, we have the superpowers, if you like. And so Kashyapya is sort of this, not just a fully ordained monk, but like a fully accomplished monk. And not only that, he's sort of going around speaking in praise of wearing robes, doing you know being a buddhist monk or a buddhist monastic in that way and and again the idea of like being aloof from society having few wishes all of these things are sort of about the um well i guess you could call it comportment how one comports oneself in that way questions yeah no a renunciant. They are all renunciants. Right, but he's the epitome of renunciation. <laughs> and and Kashyapya is, by the way. Okay, thank like, you. Allegorically, Kashyapya is the perfect monk in that sense. But in terms of the progress of the sutra, I want you to notice how he sort of, I don't want to make it sound like I don't at all want to make it sound like Kashyapya is better than Anurudha. No, 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 not at all. But there is a sense in which we are moving towards 
more and more accomplishment in that way. Okay, so speaking of which, let's get to the next, Magulyayana. So this is for me, my favorite. My favorite is the Magulyayana one. Now, there's a lot of things that Magulyayana could say, because Magulyayana sort of is famous for a lot of things. But it's so interesting that he says, in, in answer to the question, what kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood? Madhguyayana says, da -ga -da -ga -da, two bhikkhus engage in a talk on the Abhidharma, and they question each other. And each being questioned by the other answers without foundering, and their talk rolls on in accordance with the Dharma. That's what's happening here. That's what's happening in the story. It's a bunch of bhikkhus who have gotten together to talk about the Dharma. So there's a really interesting like recursion that's going on there with Magulyayana, where he's praising what we're doing. But he's like praising what's happening in the sutra. It's very interesting. So it's a beautiful idea, this idea that, you know, what kind of a bhikkhu, what kind of a bhikkhu could illuminate the forest? Well, two bhikkhus engaging in conversation. I, I just find that one very special. I don't know why. I think I think it's because of the recursion, but um, by the way, it's a very interesting uh, word. So Magulyayana says to, remember, says to Shariputra that uh, two bhikkhus engage in talk on the Abhidharma. So the, the word that's used in the text is the Abhidharma. And that word, of course, and we talked about that word last week, it does mean like the higher Dharma, literally, like um, in many ways, if you're familiar, I've mentioned this analogy before, but if you're familiar with Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, Aristotle wrote a book on physics, like physics, like, you know, how, how the world works. It's on physics. And then he wrote a second book and it was on like deeper physics. And he called that the metaphysics. So there's physics and there's metaphysics. But in Aristotle, metaphysics is not like spirituality. It's just like advanced physics. Well, the prefix abhi in Pali and Sanskrit, it's a lot like meta. And not, of course, loving kindness meta, but the Greek meta where it means like you've got your dharma and then there's meta dharma there's like higher dharma so that's what's happening here is meta dharma higher dharma or abhidharma and that's what not only not only is magulyayana talking in praise of abhidharma but again what we're doing here in this sutra is abhidharma so he's speaking in praise again of what of what's happening here so all right now i was mentioning at the beginning of the talk tonight that that this little format where you get one person and then they kind of pass the mic to the next person and the microphone kind of get, gets passed along it's part of the formula that when you get to the end of all of the people they turn to the person who asked the question in the first place and say, all right, we've all given our answers. What about you? It's how it works in all these different sutras. And so after these six bhikkhus have all given their answers or five bhikkhus have given their answers, 
they turn, or Magulyayana turns and says, all right, Shariputra, we've all spoken to our own inspiration. How about you? And so this is where, if you're reading the sutra the way that I read it, this is where Shariputra sort of basically is like the top, like where all of this leads in that way. So all of the things we just talked about, according to Shariputra, they lead to this, to a bhikkhu who wields mastery over their mind and does not let the mind wield mastery over them. For example, in the morning, they can abide in whatever abiding or attainment that they want to abide in. <laughs> same in the afternoon, same in the evening, and it's just like a really rich person or like a king that has a closet full of clothes and can wear different things in the morning, different things in the afternoon, and different things in the evening. Same way, Shariputra says, it's like being able to ab enter any abiding or any attainment and just put it on. <laughs> and then in the afternoon, put on a different one. And in the evening, put on a different one. So let's talk about that because I'm kind of a very big proponent, of course, of Shariputra's explanation of the Dharma. In particular, what I mean is, is that this opening line about wielding mastery over the mind and not letting the mind wield mastery over the individual, to me, that's the Dharma, that's Buddhism, that's the practice, that's the teaching, that's what we're here to do. The normal default mode of any sentient being is that we are just, we are just along for the ride. And we are just along for the ride of our own habits and conditioning in that way. And in that sense, the mind wields mastery over us. For me, the entire project of Buddhism is about shifting that dynamic from when we start, where the mind has complete control over us in that way, to the point where Shariputra is at, where it's about wielding mastery over the mind. And if you can do that, if you can wield mastery over the mind, then you can enter any abiding or any attainment, morning, noon, or night, at will. By the way, there's a little bit of code language in this one that you may not have picked up on. When Shariputra says this idea of abiding in whatever abiding or attainment, that's kind of Buddhist code language. And what you kind of need to know is that they kind of use slightly different language when talking about being in a jhana or a dhyana a, what is called a meditative absorption, right? One of the four jhanas or one of the four dhyanas, that's called abiding. You abide in an abode, but those are the abodes of Brahma or the viharas of Brahma, a lot of different names. But the idea is, is that those four jhanas are abodes, Vyasa, I think the word is. I'm not exactly sure. I forget the word, something like that. But there's a word for an abode. But then there's the word samapati. And a samapati is an attainment. And an attainment is a samadhi. A samadhi is formless, non dual. You know, samadhis are deep, deep meditative states. And not everybody can get into them. They're difficult to get into. Not that jhanas are like super easy to get into, but there's a general understanding that 
kind of anybody and everybody could get into the first jhana they would just need to sort of slow down their mind a little bit but there's a kind of a sense in which the first jhana is really available for everybody but the samadhis or these attainments these are not just kind of there to be had you have to cultivate them you have to develop them you have to attain them so the language of attainment is about samadhis because they're kind of a little more difficult a little more advanced abiding as dhyanas or dhyanas Shariputra is saying that in the morning, evening, and the night, he could enter a jhana or enter a samadhi, which doesn't, whichever, whatever, and could put on a different one in the morning, different one in the evening, and so on. So, once again, kind of my point is, is that if you follow the progression of these bhikkhus, Shariputra is kind of exemplifying where we're all trying to get in that sense. So Ananda, Ravata, Aniruddha, they're all trying to gain mastery over the mind in that sense. So, and again, Shariputra sort of represents that. All right. So now that we've heard kind of that analysis, any questions, comments, or ideas about any of those topics or ideas from any of those? characters all right so now that we have that let's see what the buddha has to say about all of this so let's see so once they get to so i'm at i'm at paragraph or verse 11 so once they all get to the buddha they say, Shariputra says to the Buddha, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ravatta and the Venerable Ananda came to me to listen to the Dharma. I saw them coming in the distance and said to the Venerable Ananda, Let the Venerable Ananda come. Welcome to the Venerable Ananda. Friend Ananda, this Gosinga solid wood is delightful. What kind of a bhikkhu, friend Ananda, could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood? When asked, when asked, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied, and Shariputra repeats the whole story about what Ananda replied, and saying that that's the kind of bhikkhu that could illuminate the Gosinga solitary wood. And the Buddha says, Good, good, Shariputra. Ananda, speaking rightly, should speak just as he did. For Ananda has learned much, remembers what he has learned, and consolidates what he has learned. Such teachings as are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and which affirm a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Such teachings as these he has learned much of, he has remembered, mastered verbally, investigated with the mind, and penetrated well by view. And he does teach the Dharma to the four assemblies with well-rounded and coherent statements and phrases for the eradication of the underlying tendencies. When this was said, Venerable Sir, I addressed the Venerable Ravatta thus. Friend Ravatta, what kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solidwood tree? And the Venerable Ravatta replied as he did about meditating alone in the woods, saying that that was the kind of bhikkhu that could illuminate the Gosinga solitary wood. And the Buddha replied, Good, good, Shariputra. Ravatta, speaking rightly, should speak just as he did. For Ravatta delights in solitary meditation. He takes delight in solitary meditation. He is devoted to internal serenity of mind, does not neglect meditation, possesses insight, and he dwells in empty huts. When that was said, Venerable Sir, 
I then addressed the venerable Aniruddha, saying, Friend Aniruddha, what kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood? And the venerable Aniruddha told us all about his divine eye and being able to see a thousand worlds, and saying that that was the kind of bhikkhu that could illuminate the Gosinga solitary wood. And the Buddha replied, Good, good, Shariputra. Aniruddha, speaking rightly, should speak just as he did. For with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, Aniruddha surveys a thousand worlds. When this was said, Venerable Sir, I then addressed the Venerable Maha Kashapya, saying, Friend Kashapya, what kind of a bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood? And the Venerable Maha Kashapya told us all about being a good monk and wearing the robes and so on, and, and said that was the kind of monk. Apologies for that. Hold on one second. Yeah, about being a forest dweller himself and saying that that was the kind of bhikkhu that could illuminate the Gosinga solitary wood. The Buddha replied, Good, good, Shariputra. Kashyapya, speaking rightly, should speak just as he did. For Kashyapya is a forest dweller himself and does speak in praise of forest dwelling. He has attained to the knowledge and vision of deliverance himself and speaks in praise of the attainment of the knowledge and vision of deliverance. <clears throat> When this was said, Venerable Sir, I addressed the Venerable Maha Magulyayana, saying, Friend Magulyayana, what kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood? And the Venerable Maha Magulyayana replied, saying, Here, Friend Shariputra, two bhikkhus engage in a talk on the higher dharma, and that that was the kind of bhikkhu that could illuminate the Gosinga solitary wood. Good, good, Shariputra. Magulyayana, speaking rightly, should speak just as he did, for Magulyayana is one who talks on the Dharma. When that was said, the Venerable Maha Magulyayana told the Blessed One, Then, Venerable Sir, I addressed the Venerable Shariputra, saying, Friend Shariputra, what kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood? And the Venerable Shariputra replied, Here, friend Magulyayana, a bhikkhu wields mastery over his mind. And it's that kind of a bhikkhu that could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. Good, good, Magulyayana. Shariputra, speaking rightly, should speak just as he did. For Shariputra wields mastery over his mind. He does not let the mind wield mastery over him. In the morning, he abides in whatever abiding or attainment he wants to abide in during the morning. At midday, he abides in whatever abiding or attainment he wants to abide in, abide in at midday. In the evening, he abides in whatever abiding or attainment he wants to abide in during the evening. When this was said, the Venerable Shariputra asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, which of us has spoken well? You have all spoken well, Shariputra, each in his own way. Hear also, hear also from me what kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. Hear Shariputra, when a bhikkhu has returned from his alms round, after his meal, he sits down, folds his legs crosswise, sets his body erect, and establishing mindfulness in front of him, resolves, I shall not break this sitting position until through my not clinging, my mind is liberated from the taints. That kind of bhikkhu could illuminate this Gosinga solitary wood. That's what the Blessed One said. Those venerable ones were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. 
All right. So this concludes <clears throat> with everybody reporting or Shariputra reporting what had just happened. And the Buddha saying for each one of them, that's good. That's good because that's what they do. That's what they're like. And then this final reversal where the Buddha says, I, I want to play. <laughs> I want to play too. I want to share what I think. And so hear also from me what kind of a bhikkhu could illuminate the Gosinga solitary wood. And so it's a pretty generic description of a monk or a, a, a renunciant, monk or nun, in terms of going out for alms round, having a meal, sitting down, folding the legs, sitting in meditation, establishing mindfulness right in front of you, but then making this resolve that I shall not break this sitting position until through not clinging, my mind is liberated from the taints. So, I think given the, you know, the formula of the sutra here, of course, the Buddha is kind of talking about himself in that way. It's how I read it. Seems safe to read it. Everybody else was kind of referring to themselves. So the Buddha is saying that he's the type of bhikkhu in that sense that goes begging for food, comes back, sits down, eats, meditates, but the Buddha, if, I, if I'm reading this correctly, the Buddha is saying that he's the type of bhikkhu that when he sits down can resolve, I shall not break this sitting position until through not clinging, my mind is liberated from the taints. And when I first read this sutra, I, I basically laughed out loud, as I do with many sutras, because I find many sutras very funny. But I'll tell you why I laughed out loud. Actually, I have to, I have to kind of show you why I laughed out loud. Because when I read this the first time, and I was kind of, you know, visualizing the sequence of events here, I read the Buddha saying this, right? Well, you know, like let me let me tell you what kind of a bhikkhu could illuminate the the forest, the type of bhikkhu who after they've returned from their alms round sits for meditation and resolves, I, I basically, I will not get up. I'm not going to sit up until through not clinging, my mind is liberated. <laughs> That's what I saw was the Buddha sit up and be like, bye because my mind's liberated. <laughs> so, but regardless, I think it's a lovely little sutra. I think it's just a gem in that way. Uh, I have plenty more to talk about, plenty more of little things to say, but any questions, comments, or ideas about the whole arc, what the Buddha said, they okay? So I wanted to mention three, ah, all right, so I have my little notes. So I just want to mention a couple little things about this sutra that I find interesting. So of course, the main thing that I find interesting is this format of what I call the daisy chain kind of thing. So. I think it's very interesting. The other thing that I find important, and what I mean by important is if you read a lot of Buddhism, if you read a lot of sutras, this sutra, I, I don't want to make it sound like this sutra is like the most important sutra in the world, but I want to just talk really quickly about, well, it's the, the, um, it's the question. It's the question that Shariputra asks. It's this idea of, of what kind of a person could illuminate 
this forest. And I just want to kind of like point out that 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 idea of, well, the idea of illumination, but in particular, like the idea of people being luminous, it's a very Buddhist thing. Like they talk a lot about it in that way. And I think that for me, what's important to kind of not do for me when they're talking about illuminating the the forest i don't think it's wise to think in terms of photonic light like lamp light and what i mean is is and i i, I give this talk a lot i'll, I'll get a, i'm going to give you a very very short version of it but what it is, is it's about recognizing a relationship between light and knowledge. And what I mean is, is that if, if I don't understand something, in English, we even say, I'm in the dark. <laughs> Like, I don't understand what's going on. I'm in the dark. If somebody comes around and shows something to me and says, no, 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 look, da, 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 da. if their explanation, like, through their explanation, I might go, oh, I see. But notice that I'm not referring to my eyes and there's a, there was a kind of a process of illumination, but we're not talking about putting on a lamplight. I have found that Buddhism uses the metaphor of light a lot when referring to the acquisition of knowledge or the sharing of knowledge. And so when they're talking about a bhikkhu that could illuminate the forest, again, I don't think they're talking about literally beaming with light. They are th I think they're talking about the wisdom and knowledge that could like illuminate <laughs> the minds in that way. So first of all, there's that, the kind of that metaphor, if you will, of illuminating the forest. And there's also another little subtle thing in there. And it's that beautiful refrain. Uh, it's the refrain about how uh, the night is moonlit. And by the way, it is a moonlit night tonight. The solid trees are all in blossom. It's spring, right? Trees are in blossom. And then this idea that heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air. It's another kind of um, uh, thing that you find a lot in Buddhist sutras, just in Buddhist literature. And it's sort of like mysterious heavenly smells. And it's another way of, I mean, you know, all of these things you can read and understand a million different ways, but there is a sort of association in Buddhism between like, well, flavors and smelling and mm, another kind of way of talking about knowledge or wisdom in that way. So to talk about how heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air, it's sort of like this idea that like wisdom was in the air, liberation was in the air. It just, it smelt like freedom in the forest. That's how I read that line of, it was as if heavenly scents seemed to be floating in the air. So just these beautiful little things. And I mention them to you because they become such a central part of Mahayana sutras, where people are, you know, beaming light all over the place and smells are coming from all over, from, coming out of people's hair pores and things like that. And so it's kind of nice to see 
the earlier versions of that type of uh, poetic language. Yeah. All right. I think the only, the last thing that I kind of, kind of want to mention. Yeah, I, I feel like for me, yeah, especially having gone through it with you all tonight, for me, the the real like juicy teaching for me that I, I've come back to a few times is the the Shariputra one about wielding mastery over the mind, not having the mind wield mastery over you. And in particular, I just want to go a little deeper just for a moment. I want to go a little deeper with this idea of of abiding in whatever abiding or attainment he wants in that way. So I kind of just want to put all that together and talk about like, well, I guess I want to talk because I started talking about this either last week or two weeks ago or whenever it is. But what I started talking about was well, it was sort of along the lines of talking about mind states. And it was about the idea of like an angry mind state or like a delighted, joyful, happy mind state. And what I mentioned, and again, I don't know if this was last week or whenever it was, but I mentioned this idea of let's say uh, a happy, joyful mind, right? And what I was talking about was that there is sort of one mode of being, there's like one way of doing this. And what it is, is it's the idea of like, you know, that there's some object or some um, whatever it is, uh, maybe a, a travel, so like an experience or again, an object or whatever it is. But the idea is, is that there's something, an experience or an object that if I get it, will produce joy and happiness, right? And what I was talking about was that's, and you know, this is classic Buddhism, that's okay, provided you can get that, provided you can attain that thing. But what happens is, well, two things happen. One, when I start putting like the idea of like, oh, happiness, happiness is right over there. Happiness is that thing. When I do that, meaning when I have the mentality that that thing will make me happy, two things are happening. The first thing that happens is, well, I couldn't possibly be happy now then because I don't have that thing. So by saying that happiness is that thing over there, you cut yourself off from happiness now here because you've said it's dependent upon that thing. And that leads me to the second problem. The second problem is that every time I acquire that thing and I get the happiness, it reinforces my dependence on that for my happiness. And it makes me less capable of being happy without it. That's It's a tricky situation. Now, what I was talking about in a previous Dharma doors, I was talking about the idea of there's the thing and then I get the thing and then there's the happiness. What if you could just cut to the happiness? Like what if you could just go straight to the happiness and get rid of the dependency on the other object thing? For me, that's what Buddhism is about. That's what it's all about, actually, is we are all dependent on sensual objects and have grown dependent on them in an addictive way. And we've cut ourselves off from just sort of the 
ability to be pleased. We need something to be pleased. So what we can do is, is that we, we can cultivate states of joy that arise from independence from things. And that's called meditation. That's called practicing contentment. You are practicing being content until you are actually content. <laughs> now, the reason why I'm mentioning all of this is because for me, when my happiness is dependent upon things in that way, well, if my happiness is dependent upon whatever it is, that means that in the morning, I need to get that thing in order to be happy. I can't just put on the robes of happiness and then in the afternoon put on the robes of joy and then in the evening put on the robes of delight. No, I, I don't actually have Shariputra's freedom because I'm dependent upon all these things. So kind of what I was wanted to get around to or what I was trying to explain is my understanding of this Shariputra is kind of trying to get us to see that when you have mastery over the mind, there is this freedom then to abide however you would like to abide. And it's now totally up to you. you it's not dependent in that way. And so that's how I hear Shariputra's description of being able to attain any abiding or any attainment whenever he wants, because his mind isn't dependent on anything in that way. And I, and I think that that's a very, it's an extremely powerful teaching to, to say the least. I mean, cause that is liberation. Like that is uh mukha, that is moksha. That is that idea versus the idea again of being dependent upon things. And it's, that's not free. All right, questions, comments, answers, ideas? All right, Mar oh, Maria, sorry, I did not notice. Oh, just a um, couple things that you reminded me of. Um, the first one was on, at Well of Being Wednesdays, Ryan Redmond was there and he was talking about a scientific study um, on llamas in the bardo state and th one of them held themselves in that state for many many days and I want to say it was somewhere around eight but that whole time they were apparently emanating some kind of pleasant aroma mm. so when you were talking about the lovely smells <clears throat> made me think of that excuse me and then um the the light and the illumination and um the recurring theme of women in buddhism and them sort of being obscured um there's a a great book um about w women's contribution to uh the buddhist canon called the hidden lamp um so i was reminded of that title um when we were talking about that Nice. Offer yeah. those comments. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Robin? Uh, early on, there was an, a line uh, uh, where uh, I'm not sure exactly who said it. It was that I think that the monk is always in the ascended one's presence. Um, I was, I, I love that. Um, I, as I wonder if it's a, if that's a, something that's sort of a compliment or and an also is that somewhat of a description also of what this is um always in the ascended one's presence i don't remember that line if somebody could remind me especially if you have the wisdom version i don't recall that line robin i would totally love to comment on it you don't remember which monk or I was before um all of the monks. Oh um and uh so, or pretty early on. Mm -hmm. 
but but I um I just thought that was um maybe just sort of a lovely compliment mm -hmm. and um a, a neat uh visual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sorry I can't find that exact line to comment on it. Um I did want to quickly mention um Maria's comment about the smells. Um, I did want to just add to that because that is an interesting thing real quick. The, yeah, that, um, you know, you, you may be familiar, Maria. Ah, right. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tori. So I'll get back to Maria and the smells in a second, but Tori put the quote there and that was about Ananda. And that's what I was mentioning about Ananda being the Buddha's attendant. And so he was like his right-hand man. Sir, that's what it meant. That's what that refers to. Yeah. Um, regarding the smells, Maria, real quick, you know, you might be familiar with in the Catholic tradition, if people die, they often sometimes emit a floral sense and it's a sign of their sainthood or their body doesn't decompose. That's a sign of their, but the smell is one. And the one thing that Maria, your comment, the one thing I wanted to add to that Around smelling, you know, smelling is very uh, psychological. And what I mean by that is, like, I notice it of myself, I see it in others. And it's sort of like the way that if you're in a really bad mood, I don't know if it's just that you detect foul odors more or what, but there's a way in which sort of being in a foul mood is is appropriately named right being in a foul mood and there's a flip side to that which is that being in a good mood you can sometimes smell the sweeter things in life in that way so i just wanted to make that comment about how kind of tricky smell is that way like that maybe it's a little bit more interpretive than we like to think if that makes sense. Um, hey, everybody, if you have just one second, I just want to make a quick announcement before we go, if you don't mind, and if no, you don't mind. So really quickly, I just want to let you know, and it's kind of related a little bit to the suture tonight. Um, so starting in April, I'm going to be doing my own course series, and I just wanted to let you know about it. I'm going to do a 10 week sutra study on this sutra, the Shurangama Sutra. And as you can tell, it's a, it's a pretty big sutra, which is why I'm dedicating a whole like course to it. It's a very famous sutra. It, it, it's arguably my favorite sutra. Um, it's really amazing. But the reason why I'm mentioning it here tonight, um, well, first of all, it's going to start on April 18th. It's going to go to June 20th. It's going to be on Thursday nights. You can find out all about it on my website, lotusunderground.com. But the reason why I wanted to tell you about it is, is that this sutra, the Shurangama Sutra, and Shurangama means invincible. This is the sutra about being invincible. This sutra has a very famous section where 25 different enlightened masters including some of the ones we even met tonight. It's a, another daisy chain section of the Buddha basically asks his 25 senior Bodhisattva disciples, so how'd you get enlightened? And each one of them gives a description of how they got enlightened. And it's one of the, it's one of the best moments in any sutra. It's another, again, example of this daisy chain format we've been talking about. And so if you're interested in sutras, if you're interested in like the really deep stuff, I'm looking forward to teaching this one uh, starting next month. So you can find out about that. Otherwise, I'll be back here next Sunday. Or I will not be back here next Sunday night. I haven't told Gnome yet, so this will be a surprise to everybody, but I will need to take off next Sunday. Not necessarily for Easter, but I am going out of town, so I will need the, the day off. So I will not see you for two weeks then, and then we'll pick back up with another sutra. So yeah, Jenny. Are you coming up here for the big wheel race? 
I'm not. I'm going to Riverside to see my folks. <laughs>